Welcome to statistics class. Thank you for being here. You're in the right place, right? So this is UBA 337. So this is the second of two statistics classes. We're applying the things you learned last time, right? My name is Todd Daniel, and I will be your instructor. And you know that because I am wearing a tie. It's kind of a psychological thing. You know, if you wear a tie, people think, oh, you must know something. I'll listen to him. Turns out that's actually not the best advice. There are plenty of people that wear ties that say things you shouldn't pay attention to. But that's where the, that's where the letters come in. The, these, are my, these are my letters, right underneath my dogs. So those letters, I paid a lot of money for those letters. You know this, right? Because you're paying a lot of money for your letters right now. And what are you going to do with those letters? You're going to get your letters at the end of your four years, right? And then you're going to go to an employer. And you're going to say, look, I got my letters. And then you say, great. They give you a job. And at the end of the week, they give you some numbers. Right? You take those numbers down, you put them in the bank, they show up in your checkbook, you pay for things with those numbers. People get really obsessive about numbers. Who's got numbers? Who doesn't have numbers? How many numbers you have? Some people have too many numbers. So really, that's what life is. It's about numbers and letters, right? It's just this trade-off between numbers and letters. You, you get more letters, right? Then maybe you get more numbers. That's kind of the promise, isn't it? It's not supposed to work. So let me tell you what my letters stand for. The MA is a Master of Arts in Counseling. That was my first career, doing therapy, doing counseling. And the LPC is a license, a licensed professional counselor. So it's a license to counsel professionally. And I found, like Sigmund Freud said, I prefer a student to a neurotic 10 times over. I discovered teaching, and I found that I loved that much, much more than I did doing counseling. And so I've completely changed that career. I went back to school, got a PhD in organizational psychology, which is more of the business side of psychology. And I'm curious, is there anyone here who is an IO major, kind of a cross major with business and IO psychology? Nobody? Would have been great if there was, you know, kind of like a uh, little vote of confidence that, okay, I.O., yeah, that's kind of, there's an overlap with, with business. Um, HR, hiring, uh, all of those aspects of business that all relates to industrial organizational psychology. And, and these are, these are my dogs. Uh, this is Mickey is the one with the short hair, and Desi is the one with the long hair. And uh, they won't appear on the final or anything like that. You don't need to know about them so much. Um, but they do appear in different places along the way in the, in the PowerPoints, and you'll see them as we go along. Uh, I just like to work, you know, with some, some fun, clever examples. So I mentioned the letters and the numbers, and that's what it's all about, because that's, that's data and statistics. That's going to be the topic of our first week, and it's really going to be the focus of what we're going to be doing throughout the entire semester, focusing on data and statistics and telling stories with numbers, and sometimes even with letters. This is the book that we're going to be using, but you have this book in the form of an e-book. You have this in an electronic version through the Cengage, it's not called open access, it's called Unlimited. Unlimited. And I'll be using some information from that website, I'll be tying it all back into Blackboard, so you will have access to this textbook, which is good because it's a heavy textbook. And if you don't want to bring one to class, you don't really need to because you'll have it in an electronic format. And I'll be hewing fairly closely to the material that's in that, but I'll also be using a lot of my own material, which you'll be discovering as we move along. Okay, so safety first. You've seen the masking requirements and you've seen Boomer and his admonitions to everybody wear your mask and that's good. But I wanna, I wanna give you a different way of thinking about this, this uh, safety first and, and everyone is concerned about uh, making sure that tables are cleaned off and so forth. So uh, instead of thinking of safety first, I want you to think about safety third. This is an idea that comes from Mike Rowe. If you've ever watched the show Dirty Jobs, see Mike Rowe. It was that the idea started with everyone on the crew was always talking about safety first, safety first. And they began to think, what if it was like safety third? What, what if it wasn't safety first? And they begin to kind of play with this idea. And here's my take on that. You are hearing much about, we're gonna do what we can to keep you safe, okay? And that's good, and that is true, and that is being done on your behalf. Don't trust it. You should assume that everyone else is operating under safety third. That safety is not the highest priority. 
for you, it, no one else cares about your health and safety more than you do. So you've got your gel for your hand. You've got whatever you need to keep this area clean. Uh, by the way, the classrooms are cleaned after every third class. That's safety third. So whatever you need to do to stay safe, to whatever you need to do, I got your back on that. I support you in that. So please do that. And, and I will also say, just from a personal standpoint, thank you so much for being here with the masks. I was having like anxiety dreams about what am I going to do if somebody comes in and they don't want to wear a mask and I got to call it. Oh, it's a disaster. And so thank you. Thank you for alleviating that stress. I do appreciate that. Why? Because these are the numbers. I'm a stats guy. I want to see the numbers. At the end of last week, as of last night, number of new cases reported just under 40. You can see the pattern over the last three weeks. That's the reality that we're all living in. So you take care of you knowing that these are the conditions. Part of that is the seating chart. Now the way this works is HIPAA and other regulations so you won't get an email or a phone call from someone saying, hey, the kid next to you had COVID, so you gotta get a test. You may be contacted by someone from the university saying that you may have been exposed to COVID and we'd like you to come in and get a test. So the way this works is if somebody tests positive, they're gonna wanna know who were they sitting by and what was the, the radius in which they were sitting. Uh, that's why I'm doing this. So that's just actually for today because there's actually something else that we're going to be doing and that is with the blended class structure we're going to be meeting on monday or wednesday and then the remainder will be online hence blended class which means that you do not need to be here on monday and wednesday you can choose which one you want to attend you you can you can attend both if you really want to but what else I'm going to be doing is this recording. So every Monday, I will be recording the lecture. I'll take that SD card, throw that into some editing software, put that up on probably on YouTube and then link it back into uh, to the Blackboard. So if you were not in class for any reason, whether you were exposed, whether you had a quarantine, uh, whether you were just feeling a little under the weather that day and you didn't want to take the risk of exposing anybody else or for any other reason. All of the lectures will be recorded for the blended class, for the online class. Everyone will have access to exactly the same material. There will be nothing on the test that is not fully covered in the notes and the videos that I give you. I will have study guides for the test, basically know this kind of stuff going into the test. So if for any reason you're not able to be here on one of those days, you will have access to everything that we're doing. Okay, so I know some of us, I know I love the face-to-face, -face, right? But if you ever for any reason feel unsafe, remember safety third, you take care of you, I will always make sure that you have access to everything that we're covering. Nothing will be on the test that we have not covered probably multiple times. Any questions so far? Sir? What do we do on Fridays? Oh, that, that is kind of the time set aside for the online portion. And, and I'm actually going to show you the things that we will be covering with that. So actually now would be the perfect time to do that. So here's how this will work. So here are the things that you will find, obviously the announcements, like, hey, I opened up Blackboard. That was totally my bad. I thought it opened automatically, but it turns out I'm the one that has to go in and set it to make it available. So my fault. Um, that said, I posted this important announcement, which basically says fully online section, got you guys covered, blended section, you choose either Monday or Wednesday, everybody has access to exactly the same information, so what I just told you. So those are the announcements. Syllabus and schedule, there we go. You can, I'll try to work on the, uh, I don't know if you guys can actually see the, 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 the ratings for how accessible these are. Try to make everything accessible. This one I haven't just because I have to mess with it a little bit more. Here is the syllabus. I'm gonna hit some of the highlights here. You got your course description, your course objectives, the kind of things we're going to cover. Course materials, there's that Cengage Unlimited. You will need that and, and it will be used. So you don't worry that you're gonna pay for something and not be used. You will use it extensively. 
Uh, we're going to be using Microsoft Office with Excel. Use a software called JASP. Uh, you need a PDF reader and this respondent's lockdown we're going to use for each of the four tests. So test one, two, three, and the final. Uh, and that's how they work. So we're going to do four week modules. Uh, the final is just the last module, so it's not comprehensive, right? And I can do that because, honestly, it, you, you can't do this stuff on the final if you don't know this stuff from, you know, chapter one anyway, so it's just going to work straight through. And I will have uh, study guides for that as well, so you'll have, you'll know, here's what you need to know. And again, I can do that because this really is, in many ways, a skills class. I'm going to have you do things with Excel or with JASP or you know, run analyses. You can't fake it. <laughs> you either know how to do it or you don't. So I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know, but I'm not too worried. There's, there's, not, a, there's not any really good way. If you were trying to, like, I'll just say it this way, if you're just trying to cheat your way through the, the, the stuff that we're doing each week, you're going to be sunk when you get to the test. So, hey, might as well learn it and we'll have plenty of chances to practice. I'll even have some additional material that is optional or ungraded. And the reason that I'm putting that up is just to get a chance to redo the skills. Uh, for the rest of this, I'm just going to do skim through it so you know what it is, and you can check out the syllabus a little later. So we have the method of evaluation, homework and exams and quizzes and so forth. Uh, late work, readings, we're going to do readings, and then we have respondus. And some tips for using Respondus. And we have technology. There's a bunch of stuff. I get new requirements of here include all this. Uh, of course, schedule, participation, that I want to come back to. Okay. Contacting your instructor. Um, I'm available on email pretty much all day, uh, early till fairly late, at least at least by five. So I'm not I'm not promising that I will be able to respond you know, after five. I probably will, and and but if you don't hear from me, if you if you send me an email later after business hours and you don't hear from me right away, I'll get back to you in the morning. Okay. Um, medical and civility, face mask policy. Again, thank you for wearing mask. Academic integrity policy, so things I'm sure you have seen in other syllabi. And if you need me to go into more detail, I will. But I'm assuming you can read through these and make yourself aware of this camera for fair use. Um, discrimination, disability accommodation, blackboard ally, uh, drop a class, religious accommodation, mental health and stress management, Title IX, which was a name policy, and the bear claw. The only thing I did not include that I wish that I had is uh, we'll have an opportunity for tutoring as well. So there'll be a tutor assigned to this class. So here's our schedule. Test one is really just going to be over chapter 10. But there's other stuff that we're going to cover between now and then. So the review of statistics, that's kind of what we'll be working on this week. Uh, I'm going to teach you about JASP next week. Uh, and then we're going to basically be doing uh, independent and paired samples t-tests after that, which is actually quite a bit to get your mind wrapped around. So if you can get through that, that's good for one test. Okay, And then you can see where we'll be going after that. Uh, variance tests. Uh, Look at when those are used. They're not terribly common, but they're just a nice little tool to have. Uh, the chi squared stuff, the goodness of fit. I'm going to do some factorial ANOVA where we're basically taking three groups and matching those. Simple regression, multiple regression, regression modeling. Uh, so I'm going to show you some of the basics and then we'll look at repeated measures, which would be that time series analysis. Uh, we will have some stuff on non parametric equivalency test and quality control, which is actually pretty interesting stuff. The quality control is actually, like a, that's a good skill to have if you're gonna be in business because you, you can you definitely put that on the resume, that can be very useful. So I'm gonna cover that in a way that you'll have a skill that will be marketable with that. All right, now that's a lot of stuff. We got correlation and regression and chi-square and t-tests and variance tests and Levine tests. We, we have a lot of tests to cover. And if I just throw out a bunch of information like names of tests that you've never heard of, it makes it, hard to learn. So I don't want to do that to you. What I want to do is just real simply kind of break it down for you what we're going to be learning about. I want to try to teach the entire class in about 30 minutes because I have, I have a bag of numbers. I have a bag of numbers. These numbers, they're, they're on wooden chips. 
and each chip has a single number on it. There's a lot of them. And here's what I want to know from you. If I add up all of these numbers, what would be the total? Can anybody hazard a guess? What's the total of all of the numbers in this bag? Okay, and, and where did that come from? Yes. That is a, 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 a W-A-G, a, a, a wild guess. Yes. And is it, is it a good guess? It's as good as any other guess. Okay. You don't know the total of the numbers in here. But here's what I would like for you to think about. What would you want to know about these numbers so that you could tell me what is the total of the numbers in this bag? What kind of things would be useful, sir? The range. The range of the numbers. So, like, are these numbers like from zero to five, or are they from you know one to nine, or are they like all, you know, twenty-two to twenty-eight? What what's the range in which these numbers fall? Excellent. Okay. So that's what we wanted. What, what kind of numbers? Oh, by the way, they are, they are from zero to nine. What else would you want to know so you can give me a much better estimate of the total in here, sir? How many chips are in the bag? How many there are. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I can count them, right? But I'm not going to because I'm not the point. This represents something. I'll, I'll just see. Any idea what, what this represents? It's okay if you don't know, but remember population? This is the entire group about which I want to know something. So, yes, it would be great to know how many there are, but even if I don't know how many there are in the whole bag, I can figure out how many there are if I do something very specific, which is called taking a sample. I could take some of these chips. I could get the total of those. I could figure out how many there are. And the formula of total divided by how many? That's called the mean, or the average. And that actually gives us something really useful to work with because no matter how many of these chips that I take, if it's only 10, or if it's 25, or 50, no matter how many I take, I can use that mean, and that division is gonna let me standardize, if you will. That number is gonna be much more useful to me. So if I know how many other numbers are, I know the range of those numbers, you know something else that might be useful? Eva is just looking for a total, is I could take the numbers out and I could like, oh, there's a three. Okay, so I'm gonna stack it, there's a three. And oh, there's another three. I could stack these up. I know you may not be able to see that, but I can illustrate this even better because I have another bag. Now in this bag, I have poker chips. There's a lot of them. So my question for you is, if I reach in this bag and pull out a poker chip, what color is it? So what is the first thing you would like to know about the poker chips that's gonna help you make a guess as to what color they might be? How many colors are represented? Essentially, it's the range of categorical data. So I have, in keeping with some, you know, some, some good use of uh, video technology, I've got RGB. I've got red, green, and blue. Those are the three colors represented among all the chips in the bag. Okay, anything else you would like to know about these chips? If I say, I'm gonna reach in, I'm gonna pull out one of them, what color will it be? Anything else that would be useful? So again, how many, right? So if I know how many red and green and blue there are, and what happens is, when I solve that problem, when I start stacking up poker chips, which I'm going to try to do as I'm talking and sort of vamping along the way, what we're going to call a distribution of chips. I'm do this for the benefit of the camera. So do you see my distribution of chips? So if I were to reach into the bag, pull out a chip, and ask you what color do you think it's going to be, what's going to be your best guess? Red. Red, because there's a whole lot more of those. Now you may remember 
in a previous class that you've taken on statistics, where we talked about distribution, like the normal distribution. When we talk about a distribution, whether it's a poker chips or numbers or anything else, that number that of which there are the most, remember which number that is? That is the mean. That's the one where we add up how many there are and the total, we divide total by how many, and it gives us a mean, it gives us an average. That number, there are more numbers at or close to the mean than any other part of that distribution. So if I were to tell you, I'm going to pull out a number from here, and, and not just one number, I'm actually going to do a sample of numbers. I'm going to pull out a sample of numbers, I'm going to add up all of these numbers, I'm going to divide by the total number of chips, I'm going to tell you the mean. If I knew that the mean of the bag was 5, what would be your best guess for the mean of my sample? 5. Right. Again, you don't have enough information. You don't have all the information you wish you had. But if that's all you have, that's what we're going to go with. Now, one sample, that hardly seems enough to tell me much about this population. But what could I do to get a better sense of the mean of this population? Not just one sample. I can do two, or three, or five, or ten. I can do multiple samples. I can keep. So I do the first sample, and the mean is uh, nine. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, I've chosen a sample. What do you think is the mean of all of the chips in the population? Your best guess is going to be nine because it's a sample drawn from a population. We take what we know of the sample, we apply it to the population. Okay, that's a good start. But I take a second sample. This time the sample is eight. So now I'm asking you, what do you think is the mean of the population? I'll go with 8.5, all right? I take another sample, it's an 8.3. Another sample is an 8.2, and then another 8.3, and then a 7.9. And now I'm going to ask you again, what do you think? Are, are you mentally changing your calculus of, we started with nine as a mean, but is it kind of mentally slipping a little closer now to eight? Because the more samples you take, the better your estimation. So you may recall in stats class, we talked about samples and statistics, populations and parameters. Here's what that means. My sample, if I take a sample, the mean of my sample is a statistic. The mean of the population, with all of the elements replaced, the mean of the population is a parameter. It's still a mean. It's the mean of all of these versus the mean of my little sample. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sample. I'm going to apply what I know about the sample to the population. Right? And I'm going to estimate parameters. So if someone asks what you learned in stats class today, you can say, I learned a little bit about parameter estimation. Just make them think you're really smart. Right? Parameter estimation just means that I'm going to create a model, which is a sample. I'm going to use what I learned from that model to make inferences about my population. So when I'm able to say, here is what I predict will happen, or here is what we know about this particular variable or construct in the world, I'm estimating parameters. I'm taking things that I know and have studied and I'm applying those to something that I don't actually know, but I'm making a good educated guess about it. Samples, populations, estimations, parameters. Now there's one other bag I want to tell you about. It's about data. Everything that I've talked about so far relates to data, types of data. And quite honestly, if you've not seen this before, it's a little bit confusing and it doesn't make much sense. So let me clarify this for you. Data comprises two types of data. There is categorical and quantitative. So categorical, that's my poker chips. That is that distribution that I created. Categories, what are my categories? Red, green, blue. Now, I could describe them as red, green, blue with words. I could call them RGB, or I could just call them one, two, three. 
Now notice how that one, two, three, that doesn't tell me anything like, is three better than one in this distribution? They're just colors, it's RGB. It doesn't, that just describes what they are. They're categories. Now, so I could describe them with letters or I could describe them with numbers. So my first type of data is categorical. Can I put things into groups? Do I describe those groups with numbers or with things that aren't numbers? Alpha, numeric, words, letters. And, and if I do, if I describe them, no matter which way I describe them, those are just groups and they, they don't have an order to them. You see how I have two groups here? They're, they're just, there's two blocks, right? And then I, I can switch them around. There's not an order to them. They're just, they're just two blocks. And there's some categories, uh, one and two, um, walnut and maple, two groups. But then there are other categories that have some structure to them, some order to them, like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Those are categories, right? But there is an order implied in those categories. These are ordinal data. Now, they're still the three groups, but you see how they're connected? I, I can't just like go switching them around. That doesn't make sense. I need to keep that order. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Right. I want to know what's happening on each of these ordered days. There is an order to these categories. So really what I want to know, when I'm using categorical data, does it have an order or not? And if it doesn't have an order, whether I represent it with numbers or I represent it with letters, it's still nominal data. It's still just categorical groups. If I represent it with letters, I'm probably going to call that a, a string variable, but it's still just nominal. If it has an order to it, whether it's numbers or letters, it's ordinal data. And the fun really begins when we get into measuring things, when I measure something about the world. Now, what could I measure? All kinds of things. There's all these amazing things that I can measure. Does anybody else have a, have a Fitbit? Even if you don't, what could you measure about you if you've got one of these things? Okay, I'll just flip through real quick. I can tell what time it is. That time, that's actually a variable, right? It has a stopwatch on it, so I can measure how long it takes for something to happen. I can also tell you, I won't, but I could tell you how many steps I've taken today, how many steps I've taken this hour. These are measurements. These are things. See, if I have groups, I can make comparisons. Like, which of these two groups takes the most steps during the day? And maybe that relates to the construct of fitness or weight loss or recovering from a heart attack. And so what could I do differently with these groups that would lead to the one of these groups having more steps? And maybe I can even do some prediction after that, like who's more likely to live longer? And, and you may have seen, I've seen recently, there was an article about, do we really need 10,000 steps per day? So that, that's what we're looking at. We can do this. We can measure things and we put them into groups. That's what we do with data. So I know stats seems like, and it is, it, it could be a difficult class. Fundamentally, this is what we're going to do. We're going to measure things and we're going to create groups. Our groups might be numbers, they might be letters, but we're going to measure, we're going to group. The fun, at least I, I love this part, is where we get numeric data, the measurements, and then we start doing things with those measurements. Now, the, the simplest one, as I've already showed you, is I can just take a sample and I can get a mean, and I can also tell something about how far apart the scores are, something called a standard deviation, and I can use those in analysis. I can measure multiple things. But fundamentally, there are three things that we're going to do with all of these tests. Everything that we're going to discover comes under one of three things. Maybe a fourth. We're looking for differences. Is there a difference in these two groups on this measurement? That's fundamentally what a t-test is. I have two groups, I've measured one thing about them, is that different? Or I could have one group 
that I've measured two times, like I could do your pretest and your post-test. Two measurements, one group, that's what a t-test is. If I have, this is actually called repeated measures ANOVA. If I have three groups, one measurement, a factorial ANOVA, everything I'm going to teach you about could just be explained with some little blocks. If you can get that conceptually, everything else that we do is going to make sense. So the first thing I can look for is differences. The second thing I can look for is relationships. So when I measure this thing, what happens to this other thing? So if I measure height and weight, what do I discover? As height increases, what happens to weight? Well, everything being equal, uh, as height increases, let's say we start with two-year-olds, we measure through adulthood, as height increases, weight also increases. And I could even work in some covariates. You can work in some groupings. Yes, but if we have groups of, uh, of obese versus non-obese, we can work that into our predictions. So we can start looking at the complexity of the interactions. But fundamentally, it's what happens to one variable when I look at or measure the other. So I can look for relationships. Or I can take what I learned from the relationships is the third. I can look for, I can make predictions. Because I know that uh, we sell more cold soda when it's hot outside, I can predict how much cold soda we're going to want to order for the, the football uh, concession stand based upon how hot it's going to be for the game on Saturday. If I know relationships, I can make predictions. So really, that's not too far from what we all know about just being human beings, right? If you know something about the way that people interact, you can make some pretty good predictions, which is what big data is really about. If I know something about the way that people behave before they buy something through an online site, I can make some pretty darn good predictions and I can use that to say, ah, this person, I bet, can be convinced to buy or maybe more likely to buy by doing this thing. So I'm going to be able to take what I know make predictions about that. And I said there's a fourth one. It's, it's really has to do with nominal or just counting things. You know, we can just count them up, how many there are. And that's where percentages come in. Okay, so I promised I was going to teach you a stats class in 30 minutes. If you look at the table of contents from chapter 10 through the end, I've covered everything. This is what we're going to do. We are going to measure. We are going to group. We're going to start with two groups and one measurement, then we're going to do two measurements in one group, and then we're going to start adding groups, and we're going to start adding measurements. But structurally, everything comes down to these same ideas. So this is what I have done as a statistics instructor, is just try to simplify this. If you can hold these things in your hand, which you can't right now, but someday you can. Remember. If you can hold these, if you can interact with these things, you can feel this is what a t-test is like, and it actually makes it make much more sense. So I'll have to show them to you now, but you get the idea from this. I'm going to break it all down. I have dealt with statistics people for a long, long time, and I, I love them, and I can talk with them. I wouldn't necessarily want to have them as a teacher, because I've known plenty of people who know lots of stuff that can't actually convey that to other people. What I've tried to do is bridge that, so that I can take all that stuff and make it accessible to you. My desire for you is for you to be able to move along in your education, and while everyone else says, yeah, I had that stats class, but I, I, I kind of, I, I got it, I got it in it, but I don't, I don't really know. I want you to have this gut level conception of everything that we're doing and say, it's not that bad. It's kind of like uh, just two groups on measurement. You will have that so that as you move through your career, you'll be the person that other people look to for d the clarity of understanding telling stories with numbers. That's what it's going to be about. Okay, that is. Um, what we will be doing uh, for the rest of the week, what you should do next, I'm gonna go back now to power, or to, uh, go back down to Firefox. Uh, go to course content, week one, one through four. Click on that. This is an introductory video. I don't even know if you can hear this. Let me just see if it works. Is that different than what you've seen in a lot of, Okay, that's, that's what I'm shooting for, okay? So, I just want you guys to have access to the best quality materials. Look at week one, reintroduction to statistics. Reading, so I've given you a PDF. I'm going to open that so you can see what it looks like. 
This is, ignore the week eight, that I would need to adjust that. I'm, I'm, this is the, the material kind of summarized. And then I'll explain hypothesis testing with Ancient Aliens guy and Alice in Wonderland and Scooby-Doo. Right? And then we're gonna walk through examples of the five steps of hypothesis testing just to refresh you on some things you remember from previous lectures. And then at the end of all of that, I haven't opened it up yet, but I will. There's this graded assignment. It's 10 questions, two points each, 20 points. If you have these notes and you watch the videos, by the way, the videos, five minutes. This is the longest one, but it's actually from a different chapter. That one's two minutes, this one's six minutes, they're roughly five minutes. If you just watch those, follow along with the notes, right? You can use the notes on the quiz there when you get to the end, right? So if you're watching the videos and getting the information, you should have no trouble with these weekly quizzes that we'll be doing. Now at the end of all of that, we, there are four weeks, that's when we'll do our test, and that's the one with the respondent's browser, and so you gotta, you gotta have it all crammed in your head by that point. That's what we're gonna be doing. Next week, and by the way, go ahead and work ahead if, you, if you'd like to. Stay within the sections. We'll do you know, weeks one through four. I'm going to have weeks three and, three and four ready to go. If not, yeah, I'll give this up. A, I'll give myself to Wednesday. But you'll have that information as well. Um, for week two, the software of statistics. We will be using uh, Excel somewhat. There we go. But we're also going to do some work with JASP. No, anybody heard of JASP? I'm not surprised. You've heard of SPSS? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the, probably one of the most common statistical software packages. It's really expensive. Have you heard of R and R Studio? Powerful. It's also uh, difficult to use. Am I, am I right? I mean, there's, okay. JASP is built on the R platform, but it gives you the flexibility that you might have with SPSS as far as doing those tests. Okay. Uh, I'm, it's developed in the University of Amsterdam in Holland. I'm working with them. I've developed these six videos. So these are available on the web, but they're also available to you. Six videos that'll walk you through how to install and then use JASP. So this will be the statistical software. Now here's why I'm doing this. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna dabble with some R coding and I'm gonna show you some of those things because that'll be important to know about. This is your backup. No matter what happens, you can always do all of these tests in JASP. And it's easy, much easier about being the point click stuff. The interpretation, that's where the difficulty comes in. So you, you will never get like frustrated. If you've used R, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, oh my gosh, the code isn't running. It's supposed to, and you, you, you have a comma instead of a period. And, and it's, it's, it can be frustrating. You won't have it. You will always be able to use this software to run the tests. And I'm gonna build upon that some other information that we use for them. Okay, so, stats class. You think you're gonna be okay? All right, I got you on this. I'm gonna get you through. Sorry, I have a question. So for the like week one quiz, what's that do? I think it's set up for the end of the week. Um, Friday or Sunday? It would be Sunday night. Oh. Um, let me just try that for now. Let's just try the Sunday night okay. things that you, you're Done. You can open it as soon as I get it okay. ready. You can open it, do it any time. Um, we'll just shoot for Sunday night. If you need to adjust, that's okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you show us where the quiz is again on Oh, it's not, you, you can't see it yet. Oh. I, I, I've uploaded it and I need to format it and then I'll release it. Okay. Anything else you need to know? Thank you for, oh, go ahead. Where's the course calendar? Logo? Course calendar is under syllabus. Click on syllabus, of course, calendar, I'm calling it a schedule, but that's oh, okay. it. That's okay. Right okay, thank you for being here. Thank you for being safe. I will, I will be here on Wednesday. I don't know if anybody else will. Have a great week, and I'll see you for sure, some of you, on Monday.